Hi, everybody. There, the recording is in progress. Did you guys hear my computer say the recording is in progress? Yes. Well, why does my computer do that now? I've never Anyone heard that is? before. It You've says it to us that? so that we can choose to leave the meeting if we don't want to be recorded. Is that it? Yes, because we get a message that says you have to okay. click continue. Because so. I'm doing that before and I was recording a webinar with myself and then it just started talking to me. I'm like, why is it doing that? What is happening here? All right, well, now I learned something today. That's good. Awesome. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the town hall. It's Monday and we're learning stuff. <laughs> We got a big group here with us today. That's exciting. Uh, again, not much of a plan, which is fine, but I do have a plan, what I'd call like a sliver of a plan. And really the plan only came to me because Gail sent, sent me an idea. Um, and this sliver of a plan is Gail's and I'm just going to latch it. No, Gail. So no. Gail had a plan. I don't have a plan. Gail had a plan. Um which Were you know. having me sing or dance? Yes. Both. <laughs> I forgot my tap shoes. <laughs> you choose which one to do and when to do it, and we will all be ready accordingly. Now okay. it's it, it's interesting. So so Gail's email to me came after Gail, was this after the quiet leadership group session that you sent this over to me? Um or was it one before that? It was, I think it was either after, yeah, it was after the quiet leadership group because that was when the topic of consideration came up. Yeah, and and, and just in our, our course of conversation, um, we were talking about consideration with the leadership group and then Gail forwarded this question to me and, and I thought it was such a great conversation that maybe it becomes the basis of our discussion today. Um, and so here's, and, and Gail, I think I took this right from your email. So if I did, I think I'm quoting Gail right now. If we've been trying to do consideration for the last 25 years and we still aren't succeeding, what is lacking? What have we not done or not described that would make it become an inter integral part of our educational system? That sounds really good. <laughs> good. I wanted to give you credit for that. I took it right from that email when you sent it to me. Okay, read it one more time. Oh, geez. All right, wait a second. I closed my phone. If we have been trying to do consideration for the last 25 years and we still aren't succeeding, what is lacking? Part two of that is what have we not done or not described that would make it become an integral part of our educational system? So can I say a little bit more? Of course. Like at the last HE chat or the quiet HE chat meeting that I attended, when somebody asked like which of the quality indicator areas is the most um, in need of use or backup or additional stuff, it was pretty, at least half the group said consideration. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the following day, I believe, I attended a uh, state leaders and assistive technology meeting, a slate meeting, and it, the exact same conversation came up um, and almost with the same words. So one of the things that's happened to me over the years is that as when I hear nationally the same questions over and over and over again, it makes me start to think about what as a field have we not done right? Mm -hmm. um, and I've actually had a couple of conversations with people about how we may have um, steered the, the boat of consideration a little off course um, as we were trying to be as clear as possible. But it's just a I, it's just a thing I've been wondering about a lot. It's, if everybody's either not doing it or not doing it well in terms of individual IEP teams, why is that? And what can we do? Because we, we have a huge body of knowledge and literature about consideration, but it's not going where we want it to go. So that was the chat I wanted to have today about assistive technology. So and I, think I a have great... a thought, Gail, if you don't mind my chiming Please. in yeah. on this. What if 
a couple of things. I mean, I would love to see in a perfect world, we wouldn't be considering assistive technology. We'd actually be looking at what people are already doing in their classrooms and what strategies and technology are working and what strategies and technology are missing. Um, and I, I feel like that's a piece of it. So, so often I, I've chaired like thousands of IEP meetings, right? Over the course of my time in, in, in public school. And so often assistive technology considerations were getting glossed over and I'd have to bring people back like, okay, guys, you know, we, we, this is illegal, you know, and I would always use the, well, this is illegal. This is illegal. We have to do this legally. We've got to, you know, in a, you know, when people were saying, oh, no, no, well, we're doing, well, we, we, we actually, we really do have to do this. And a lot of times I would steer the direction into, okay, tell me what you guys are doing now. Okay. You're already using visual, you know, schedules or you're already, oh, they are, they have a Chromebook. Right, and they are, you know, what, what tools and technology are they already using? And then we'd be able to flesh out better, what are they missing? Or what do we need to put in here? Like, I know, I get it, you're doing it already, but for this student, it needs to be in this document, this IEP, so that what if they're not, you know, what if they move like tomorrow? We have a lot of, we had a very highly mobile school. Like, what if they move tomorrow? Or what if you're not the teacher in that classroom? You know, we need to know what's working now. So it can't just be, well, these are already good practices that you are already using. And especially for our, our um, less, for our, our um, more high incidence population where a lot of things were, you know, are, are less complicated to put in place, right? But even in our self-contained classrooms where visual schedules or low tech systems and you know all of these kind of things were already in place. So it's I think it's kind of like that mindset shift, like if that makes sense of instead of talking, instead of like, well, what do we need to consider? Instead thinking, well, what are we already doing and what's working, right? What what stuff is in place? So I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, in the slate meeting that I mentioned, one of the conversations was um, at least one of the states, well, actually two of the states, are really focusing on present <laughs> level statements and including assistive technology in the present level statements. Um, the state of Maryland just put out a new HE guide that that almost mandates it. Uh, well, Beth, you probably know that. <laughs> Actually, I didn't know that because I haven't been doing any. I'm it, the funny thing is I'm going to be starting to do IEP IEPs again this summer. They need they desperately need people who are retired from the school district to to handle a huge overflow mm -hmm. um, of IEP meetings from um, and and so I'm going to be starting to to share them again this summer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so. I want to. Um, so that was one of the things that came up in the slate meeting. The other one was um, somebody suggested a focus on describing consideration as just take a minute. And, and she's actually making posters for, her, you know, infographics. But but to consider assistive technology could only take a minute. And then if the conversation gets larger, that's nice. One of the th best, what you described is the best, to me is the best of all possible worlds, but it requires that there be somebody in an IEP meeting who knows a fair amount about how to have that discussion. Yeah, and I agree. You know, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. It needs so much more to happen before you get to that moment. But I agree, that is ideal. I mean, that is like rainbows and unicorns right there. That is the moment. Said in a perfect world. I did say right? in a perfect Yeah, world. I mean, that's really what we're striving for. And, and oh, that would be great. But uh, I was going to yeah. add to that because I, because I am an AT specialist within a school district that I've seen the shift from when I first started my role to where we are now. And I think, again, like you were saying, that having an in-house person or somebody who is knowledgeable of it I think is a critical component. You know, now at this point, I've been doing this for several years and the teams that I've worked with, you know, through training and experience, and I guess also seeing, you know, the buy-in of that, you know, 
AT does work, <laughs> um, you know, it's not generating for me any longer. It's not me identifying the students. It's my teams that are identifying it at this point and saying, hey, we've got, sometimes it's like an overflow where I'm like, all right, let's just like pump the brakes for a minute because, you know, what could we be doing before we, you know, go down that route too. But um, I think it's that capacity building within the districts. And I think because there's such a lack of, you know, specialists, I don't know, I guess, I'm in Long Island, New York. There are very few of me that are in school districts and that there are more that are happening, you know, and, and, you know, but that be, but even within that, a lot of times it's a 0.5 position, you know, where these teachers are being stretched very, very thin in terms of what their roles look like, um, you know, how much time they have to dedicate to training teams and, you know, building capacity within districts. So I think that that's a big component of it. Whereas I am not 0.5, I'm full-time doing this. Um, so I'm able to really spend not just my time servicing students, but also being able to service the teams and building that capacity where now I'm at a point where I don't have to drive, you know, the, the referrals or the consideration it's there already, you know, and it's constantly a consideration. Right. Um, and I do think that that's something that's lacking in many school districts, you know, around our country. And then so to think about what Gail mentioned about these infographics and kind of the consideration in a minute. Is that their plan, Gail, is to find a way to replicate exactly what Leslie just said if they don't have that person? To just kind of prompt and remind <laughs> and, okay. When, it's making me think, I'm sorry, Gail, it's making me think, are, those of you who have been in early intervention, if you're familiar with um, the, um, oh, why am I blanking on what it's called, but it's the infographic, well, somebody help me fill in my aphasia right now. Um, I need to grab a guide off of something, but it's where you have to, with the parents make, you have to talk about where that child is in comparison. It's not the class, but where that child is in comparison um, to typical peers. And it's with an infographic. So it's very simple. I'm going to have to look for it, but I have it on a shelf here somewhere. But that idea of an info, because we can't go to an expert. I mean, that's the problem. Like there is no way you, you know, they're hiring people from outside just to chair meetings, right? Like you can't have an expert model that of consideration. It just, it's not feasible, right? There's too many IP meetings where there are people that don't know. And otherwise what happens, it becomes lip service to compliance that, oh yeah, I checked that box. I yes. considered AT. Agreed. All right. So I'm going to go look for that infographic. Okay. That I'm thinking okay. of. Another strategy that's popping up and I've seen it in two different states now is um, it's no longer just the checkbox, yes or no, but um, like the state of Illinois requires that you say yes and what assistive technology is needed. And if you check no, you have to say why not. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, you know, so it could be in the PLAF, it could be in the, in, uh, you know, there's some professional development things that could be done or a, a change in the IEP. Yeah, I was going to say Florida is in the process of revising our statewide IEP so that it is not just a checkbox. Uh, we have a couple of us that worked on a statewide committee where it's basically taking them through a consideration mm -hmm. when they check that box that says there's a potential need for assistive technology. It kind of goes through a, a, a checklist, which I'm not 100% a fan of checklists, but at least it's something more than we checked the box or we didn't check the box. Um, it at least is in those meetings that I can't be in because like Leslie, I, I am, you know, we have two of us for a district of 30,000 kids. There's right. no way we can operate on the, the expert model, but the places where I'm not, we do the PD when that comes out to cover, what does it really mean to be making that consideration? And especially with the LEAs, the people who are the money people sitting at the table that they understand what they're doing um, when they and make that consideration. So I'm hoping that that goes in place in August. Um, hoping it's an and Lisa, what's the checklist? It's is final, it? like less incorporated into our IEP plan. What is and the my checklist? camera's off because I you'll see I'm sitting in a car and about to start driving again. So the the term I was trying to think of it was for the child outcome summaries, which is part of what's mandated for birth to three. Now I'm going to go searching for the graphic for it. I think to jump on to what Jennifer just put in the chat, I think that she she put um, part of my thinking in the chat. Um, 
the biggest issue that she thought was about the definition of assistive technology. I'll lump one more thing on that. The definition of what is consideration. And it is not nearly as complex as people make it sound. It, they, sometimes they, it, you know, you talk to teams and they have kind of this mythical glaze in their eyes about <laughs> what consideration means. Um, and, you know, you could, you, any one of us could point to five different examples of consideration we've done on the fly, or I love Gail's in a minute. I'm a big fan of stuff that happens quick. And that idea of what you're just doing as you're talking about something is you're considering it. Don't make it more complex than you have to. Understand that you're doing that all the time. You all have the capability to do this. You don't need one of us. No offense to all of us, but you don't need one of us to do that. You do it all the time anyway. And I think those are the parts. And it goes back to, you know, what Jennifer said, it's about words and, and understanding terms and getting everybody on the same page is what these words mean um, and kind of the weight behind them. I agree. And I just think um, that when we think about, uh, of course, in Texas, we call them ARD committees, but the IEP committee, um, I mean, it's, it's got to be short and sweet. It, it, it's you know, I've tried those consideration checklists that are more than a page. That was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. um, nobody is going to take the time to look at that. Their right. ARD preparation list that they need, to, that the special ed teacher has to prepare ahead of time um, is crazy long anyways. And to give them one more, you know, pager right. full of AT stuff, no way. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and really, don't we think that a lot of the best consideration happens long before you go to the IEP meeting. I was just going to say that, Mike. I think, you know, it's a problem if this conversation is just coming up at the IEP. Right. As a team, this should, you should already start having talked about some of these things and started thinking about considerations before you even get to that IEP meeting and you're checking the box. Yeah. Because you could argue, Jennifer, at the IEP meeting is the culmination of all of this consideration. It's Absolutely. the cool, we've considered, now what? Now what are we going to do? And I'll um, go one step further, Mike, and say not only considered, but we've trialed. Exactly. Why do we wait to an IEP meeting to trial? I mean, I I'm in New York, and we're very fortunate. We're, most of the districts I work with have one-to-one -one technology. Mm -hmm. You know, what are we waiting for? You know, Add the Chrome extension and see if it works. Train the kid for 10 minutes and see what happens. Right. I've, and then I've take data. Of, oh, oh, sorry, right. Leslie. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and I've seen, we've moved away from, you know, we've moved, I should say, towards a complete, you know, trial model in our district. And I have seen so much success. And not to say we don't do formal evaluations. We do when they're needed, you know, but it's not really needed, you know, and that's what we're finding is that why? Like, it's such a, it's such a time waster of getting the tools to the kids, you know, so by doing the trial, that's also increased, you know, the tech being seen, you know, we give it a allotted amount of time, we have data collection that is involved in that, you know, and then we come back and reevaluate and say, all right, is this working or not? So I agree, Jennifer, completely, like that's a, a huge piece of it. And I've yeah. seen such a shift in, you know, the, the outreach to my students, you know, and how much it's supporting them. And ultimately, that's our goal, you know, right. I think the only thing that we really need to keep in mind, though, if we're doing that ahead of the IEP is making sure that the parents are aware that that we're doing that and also involving them in the conversation ahead of that IEP as well. Because yes. sometimes I think that piece maybe gets missed because, oh, I can just slip in here and just you try this this extension or here you know shoot you an email and say something like that but i think we always need to make sure that we're involving the parents in that conversation too i don't know what the tech right. isn't, isn't considered too you know like because that comes up jennifer too a lot for us also is like you know that there's discussions about the tech and we determine as a team like oh maybe this isn't the right thing but that's also an, an important piece to make sure that the families are aware when it's not the right consideration at that time because you don't want them, you know, a year down the road saying like, oh, well, we, you know, we were thinking assistive tech and you go, oh, well, last year we talked about it. And that wasn't, they're like, well, we weren't a part of that conversation. So, you know, we do, I, I agree. I think that's a really good point that you made. Yeah, it's so important. It, it, it's, it's the idea, you know, consideration in these trials are the similar thing to if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it. If we do it and we don't document or communicate it in some way, no one knows it happened. And, and, you know, and, and I think this idea, and you guys are, are right there with, with my, my mindset too, 
is moving away from this assessment model and moving towards this trial and consultative, interactive supporting model with teams. Uh, but to do that, we have to tell the parents what's happening. Otherwise, they will initiate an evaluation or an assessment because they know, just like consideration as a word has power, they know evaluation as a word has power. It initiates something. So oftentimes they will ask just because they feel like they haven't heard anything and they want to get something moving. They want to see some action. And I have a good example. So we just had um, a student where the teacher had um, in working on communication apps and the teacher had touch chat in her classroom on a classroom iPad. And so she had been using it with the student and he was doing pretty well with it. And so we met with mom um, because we were going to start sending the iPad home and um, she, mom got really upset. <laughs> and I had completely forgotten maybe like four or five years ago when I first started in, in my district that um, the this parent had gone out and bought Proloquo to go on an i and an iPad and spent a lot of money on all of that. It didn't work at the time for a variety of reasons that I don't want to get into, but it didn't work. Kind of a new team. Um, they're in a new place. Um, they're doing really well. The students making gains, but mom was upset and she said, "I've invested in all this this in the past and it didn't work. So what's going to make it work now?" And so you know we had to have those conversations, and I had to come back to the team and say, "We have to give Proloquo a try again because mom has purchased it. She's invested in it." But you know that was partially our fault for not including her in on that initial conversation and the team just taking what they had and using it and seeing that the student did well. And that's okay. Like, I think he could do well on both, but we also need to, again, give, give Proloquo a try. And I think that's why that parent input is so important. Um, and, and parents really appreciate it. And so, um, you know, I met with the mom like the next day and I showed her the, the, the Proloquo setup and the touch chat setup. And I said, you know, are you okay with, with moving forward with Proloquo? And she said, yes. And thank you for including me in the discussion. You know, to her, that was really important to be a part of that conversation and you know show her the differences between the two apps but I just think there can't I don't think there's not that there can ever be too much parent involvement in the IEP um, well, and I think that that we just we always have more success when we involve them in that conversation and I think that's one of the things we've learned this year in this year plus with distance learning is that you know, I think a lot of times people write off parents as not wanting to participate or not being available or not responding. And I think have also come to learn that it was not a lack of desire on a parent's part to participate. So, um, and one of the things that we found with our screening process, which was in, in place long before COVID, is that um, it's actually encouraged more parents' participation because I'm able to reach out to them. I share a Google Doc with them. It's got all of my recommendations, just like when I share it with a, with a team. Um, and, and I'm getting way more parent engagement and we're not having to delay getting things in place, but it also frees me up because I'm not doing comprehensive evaluations for kids that have, you know, that have more, more um, you know, higher incidence needs. I do have the time to go spend with my kids that are switch scanners and that use eye gaze because I'm not doing an evaluation for a pencil grip, you know, like, and that's a simple, simplistic answer. But we also have parents that say, oh, by the way, did you know we already tried whatever while we were in South Carolina and he didn't really like it, but I think maybe he's ready for it now. So a lot of those, the background information we wouldn't have even known to ask is coming out by, by process of just saying, hey, whatever I send to the, the team, I'm also sending to the parents and being able to do some virtual work has definitely helped get parents engagement to meet them where they're at and when they're available. Going back to like Gail's initial question, like, is there something we can do differently at a systematic level? I mean, to to change to make considerations more productive to have it be not a checkbox or you know one um one thing that i've always wanted and it seems like this would be a good time to 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 at least raise it among specialists is that nobody counts that data 
um, you know, we all have check boxes on our IEP. In Oregon, I am told that they don't have a uh, report developed to look at the check boxes. So we have no idea. I mean, and it, we know consideration is that uh, not always checked well on IEPs or recorded well on IEPs, but we have no way of finding out even how many kids have it. So uh, to me, one of the, it, from my you know, leadership wonk position, um, one of the things is that nobody cares. Nobody, it, it looks like nobody cares except us. So if there were ways to count or ways to, um, to find out, if I were in a district that had that data available, I'd put it in every report. So in, like was, in Wisconsin, we have linking IEP linking forms. I don't know if they're that way everywhere, but we have to link the goal to the disability related need. And so in the IEP, you have your, your goals and then it has listed, you know, what needs you're working on. And I've often thought about that in terms of, um, of our AT support, how how would that look if we linked the support to the disability related need or the IEP goal directly so that it's listed out and they're just numbered um, within our, our linking forms, um, but that would then hold some accountability for, yes, you've checked that box, now here's the tools that you could possibly use um, to, to meet that need or to meet that goal. I think it's interesting as we're talking about consideration, just listening to what everybody shared today, I think the issue also comes in, there's so many pieces to it. And as you listen to each one of us talk, we're all coming, starting at a very different place. Every state has different plans. Every district has different plans. Some have check boxes, some have forms, some have linking goals, some don't, some have ways to track AT, some do not. And so I think when we talk about consideration, it's really difficult because every single one of us is in a very different place in that process. And there is no um, you know, step or series of steps that's going to get everybody in the same place at this point. So I think that's a really great topic and, and how to get there. I think it's just gonna be hard to look at where everybody's at. And I think having the more accountability, having the forms that link together, having standard definitions, I, I feel like all those things have to almost be in place first before you can make consideration more consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I first started working in consideration a long, long time ago, um, we wrote books we <laughs> the uh, Council for Exceptional Children had about a 120 page booklet on how to do consideration. And it was supposed to make things easier for people. I think it helped inform our field in, in terms of what we thought consideration might be and how to consider it for the huge range of kids that might need assistive technology. But I think those extensive explanations um, in the long run may have, I don't know, I don't want to say do damage because it informed the field, but some of some folks are still trying to hang on to that. It, one of the things in the conversation last week was, why don't we just reissue that old CEC guide? And, you know, so it, there's still that need to do it really, really well. In addition, but I, I think what we need now is different kinds of explanations. I, I, I'm with you, Mike, my, my favorite thing is still the poster. So, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask this group was, what if you had an infographic, Beth, did you ever find that one you were looking I for? I did, it's again, it's, it has nothing to do with assistive technology, right. but I'll, I'll put it in, I'll put a link to it. It's a, it's a, and it's intended to be very easy to understand because it's for parents to be able to understand, right? It's for, Families, let me just put it in the chat. You can share um, your screen too, Beth, if you want to just share the screen real fast. Oh yeah, I can do that, sure. So let me- And you know, one of the things that, that I've discovered in the writing that I've done is that anything we ever wrote for parents was more used by 
general education teachers than anybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is in Maryland, we have what are called child outcome summaries and it's for birth to three or birth to five actually for um, students with IEPs, right? And it's, it's separate from the PLAFs. It's not the same thing as present levels, but it is very specific to families together with practitioners rating where they see their child in the context of, so again, so it's not, this is not about consideration, but it's the idea, the gra infographic pieces like these buckets. So they boiled it down to something that they could make at a really simple level. And it was a one sheeter, right? Like it's a one sheeter, it's laminated, it's a part of like, and, and I have to say, I think it's actually something that's gotten very well integrated into um, IEP meetings better than other things because the language that is used is so simple and easy to understand, right? So that's not, you know, this infographic is not gonna help the conversation of it's, you know, you can't merge this into a conversation about um, assistive technology considerations, but maybe the idea of, you know, how, you know, tools in the environment and, you know, what needs to be, you know, are they able to do this with or without supports? Uh, you know, what supports would they, would make them more independent and being, you know, all of those kinds of questions that we ask. So it's, I'll put it, I'll put the link for it in the, just for anybody to be able to see. Again, this is very specific to, you know, birth to five-year-olds um, and, and a conversation that has to happen um, with families, but it is a good, it's an infographic that has worked very well in, in meetings um, and has really helped families understand the, you know, what we're talking about in terms of, but I also wonder like with, I think, I think there's so much crossover between AT considerations and discussion of supplemental aids and services that I wonder if there's a way to merge those better or to have the AT considerations be, you know, integrated more into that because that is something I do see staff consistently. There's, you know, people do take supplemental aids and services pretty seriously and do a pretty good job kind of filling those kinds of things out. Um, and there is sometimes a disconnect, Beth, in people recognizing that a supplementary aid and service might be an assistive technology support. Exactly. Um, and they'll and, put and things so in there. They'll say this... like, oh, you know, um, you know, graphic organizers, and right. they'll say things like, you know, um, um, you know, getting to use the like, I don't know, whatever, getting to use the computer or whatever it is. Um, I mean, that's from a while back, but yeah, that, they, that's so much of what, and, and if you come up with something that you're considering for AT, it better darn well be in the, in the supplemental aids and services. Um, well, and that's just it. Cause you see that there's, there's tools and strategies listed in that section. And then you read a little further in an IEP and it's, has it been considered? Yes, because everybody knows you're supposed to check. Yes. So regardless, right. yes, gets checked. Um, but then right underneath it is a question on some of them that I see is that, you know, you've considered it, is assistive technology needed? No. Right, exactly. But then you dig down to the next section and they there's just, you're just bathed in assistive technology. Exactly. Supports. They say no, AT is yeah. not needed, but then in the supplemental aids and services, using a visual schedule and graphic work, you know, all of the different things, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, we see that more often than we see the yes, it's checked, but nothing is on the IEP. We see lots of, no, they don't need it. But then, like you said, they've got an FM system. They've right. got, you know, visual supports. They've got, you know, uh, whatever it is. And I'm like, Dude, those are all assistive technology. And I think we, probably like three years ago, we really worked hard to get away from the, if Alyssa is not involved in the student, that doesn't mean that they can't check yes on assistive technology. Like I don't have to know, which is where like we can pull a report in our peer IEP system. And I love the fact that there are kids that have AT checked and it's documented in their IEP and I don't know them. Yeah. I don't know anything about them. I, I may, you know, in reference, somebody may have asked me a question, but they're not kids that I would consider I'm responsible for on the caseload. 
Um, but trying to get people to understand the full depth and breadth of what would be assistive technology when they do a consideration, I think, and combining that with the amount of teacher turnover that we're having, um, like we're, we're struggling to find teachers to teach classes, let alone have them be teachers that have any kind of background in special education. So then you're having to do re-education every year on, no, really, these things are assistive technology. And I like give them different paper in math, give them grid paper. Don't ask, like they don't have to come to me for that. Yeah, and we, I, think, I think Alyssa too. Oh, sorry, Irene, go ahead. We, um, if, some, if a student is using some sort of assistive technology and they're independent with it, we usually will mark in considerations that no, we're not considering further it, but that we are using it because we see that considerations as are we looking at doing more with it than we're already doing? Yeah, right. And those those Irene are those are those different kinds of of solutions from consideration. You've considered AT is currently needed. It's being provided, and the students' needs are being met right now. Right. right. Eric, it's yeah. still a consideration, but good news, we've done it. Hooray, somebody's being successful. That's awesome. Let's and we have a flow chart that, that has those questions. There's mm -hmm. like four questions and they just can go through that. Yeah. Cassie. Bye, Cassie. Um, to, to go back, Alyssa, I think you're so right about those, those pieces that show up. Um, and I think it, it, those pieces that end up in an IEP, but people don't, don't tie it back to as an as being an assistive technology tool. Are we becoming victims of having so much technology in the classroom and more of a one-to-one -one or universal design for learning approach in that, and maybe that's a good thing um, for some of the people, um, they're not seeing those tools as assistive technology. They're not seeing an FM system as assistive technology for that student because just in the classroom. And maybe it's in every classroom. You know, and I have that in one of the middle schools I go to. Every room has an FM system. And when I go in to do my little spiel of, hey, what's assistive technology to a new teacher? You know, we have this conversation of what in your room would be an assistive technology support for something for somebody. And they rarely pick that out. They see that as an environmental piece, but they don't tie it to um, being an assistive technology support for a specific student. Um, and so there is some, there is some educating that has to happen there. Oh, did we do it? Did we talk ourselves out? <laughs> did we do it? No way. Come on. Going back to Gail's question like Beth did before. Beth beat me to it. I was just opening my phone when Beth says, going back to the question. Um, let's see. What have we not done or not described that would make it become an integral part of our education system? consideration. What can we, or what can we do? I, I, I still just keep going back to if we could, we're, we're putting IT in things, we're putting it in accommodations, we're putting it in goals, we're putting it in, in supplemental aids and services. We're just not always recognizing that that's part of considerations. Now, that's not to say that there aren't more things that shouldn't be looked at and considered, right? Like, um, I just sometimes think the way that we ask questions is what drives discussion at IEP meetings. And so maybe they're just, it's just not a well-asked question on the IEP. Has, has AT been considered? That's such a crappy question. <laughs> it, it's not a great question. I agree. And, and I wonder, that goes back to Gail's other question is, what does that infographic have on it? Like, well, and I think in our district, we've had to kind of break the long standing misnomer that they couldn't document anything assistive technology on the IEP because it may lead to a cost. It may right. lead to so, like, they kept thinking they had to have somebody from the district involved to be able to say yes and document something on the IEP because they kept, you know, they, they're all off, like they, they're told that all the time about, you know, additional adult support and those kinds of things that like, I had to be the gatekeeper of some sort to be able to tell them, yes, they can put that on there. We've shifted away from that, thankfully, but I think it is like you guys are saying about the question and how we ask the mm -hmm. question. 
because a lot of times I get, yes, we like we provide snap and read universally to every kid in the district. I get questions from my OTs, which I love. When, at what point does that get documented on an IEP when it's universally available as a tool? And my question is, you know, if they were to go someplace else where it's not available, is it necessary for them to make progress and, and participate in their educational, you know, support? And, and most of the time the answer is yes, because we've identified a specific tool that it just so happens to be available to everybody, but they even kind of have to feel like they have to ask permission for that to be documented. So I, I do think it's about the way that the question is asked at that meeting and I don't like that it's asked in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like, yes, we want to set the tone, but I think a lot of times people don't know how to answer the question if they haven't looked at goals or they haven't talked through part of the plan. Yeah. I'm going to piggyback off of what Alyssa Me? said. Yes. <laughs> and she's cutting out. She um, <laughs> so I think part of it too is that misunderstanding where a lot of a lot of people know the two, like the name, the product and name. So mm -hmm. they know Snap and Read. They know Read and Write for Google. But do a lot of your teachers know the features too? And so right. we talk about not naming, you know, specific equipment sometimes in the IEP, but talking about the features. And I wonder too if that that becomes a barrier for some because they just know the name of the tool. They maybe know what it does, but they don't know, you know, how to talk about um, uh, voice to text or, you know, some of those more technical terms. Right. Right. Yeah. There, there is definitely a disconnect, right? It's the, it's the Kleenex approach to things, you know, I need a Kleenex. I don't need a facial tissue. I need a Kleenex, right? I don't use word prediction. I use co-writer. I mean, I could, I could, you cash that five cents in from every time I've heard that and hang up for the rest of the day. Um, right. It's this idea of understanding. And so then it becomes more of an education issue. Um, I, I'm, I'm going and back. And that's to, where it leads you back to that expert model, because there's yeah. only certain people that know those terms versus, you know, what is the broader range that everybody knows and can describe? I, I think that's just one piece, one barrier, but yeah. a big factor too. Yeah, maybe that's part of this big infographic poster. Now I've suddenly made it big. Maybe I shouldn't say big. This <laughs> infographic poster um, is, you know, look at the things you have in your classroom that are leading to learner success. What are they doing? What are those tools or strategies doing in order to help them? And maybe that starts to reframe how they look at things. Um, and I also like Alyssa's, comment about, you know, if I'm thinking of this poster, somewhere on there, it should say, if you're using something in your room and your learner needs this to be successful, it is assistive technology for them. Like, I feel like that needs to be there to remind people that these environmental supports that are there for everyone can also be assistive technology. It's not a one or the other. It can be both. Uh, and, and sometimes that could help clarify this a little bit. I mean, this poster is getting big, by the way. Um, that Maybe I was right to say big. The poster is very large. It's going to be nice. Well, you know, I, I feel like as I think about this process that it really, and I've said this before um, to my colleagues, it's like a marketing campaign. Like, yeah. And I, I didn't go to school to be, a, a, you know, to market things, but I think that's key. And, you know, I was rereading that section um, from this book about the rule of 22, right? Um, that you can't just tell people in your district one time, like, and I know 22 is a, Chris made that number up. Like, I don't, he made that up. But the point being, you can't just say it once. Um, and how do we market? It's not just the poster. It's, right. it's my um, signature line on my email. Mm. It's um, my resources. It's the website I create. It's the every time I'm, you know, on campus, how do I get, how do I market so that people hear it enough times that they're like, hey, maybe I could try that, you know? Right. And, and, and it is interesting if I could derail us for just a minute, and I promise to bring us back. Um, Murph, are you still here? You're not on camera anymore. 
I don't, I don't want to talk about you if you're not here. Oh, you are here, right? Maybe, well, Sarah might be doing something with a student. Um, Sarah sent me a link to her sizzle reel. We talked about this a few weeks back, this idea of how to promote your successes and get the word out and show people what's happening. And so Sarah sent me her sizzle reel, but I didn't want to share it widely on social media for people to see it. But I thought if I shared it in the chat, we could all open it on our computers and no one else. If you're watching the video, it stinks to be you. You should be here on Mondays and then you'd have the link. Oh, it hurts, doesn't it? Um, uh, but what I thought of is this might lead us to our next conversation, which happens in two weeks. Next week, we're off for Memorial Day. As I said to Hillary before, if she wants to lead and set the whole thing up, Hillary will be your leader next week. If not, I'd encourage you to take the day off too. Um, but on the 7th, we're going to do our last town hall for the year. That's the one we agreed to have our last town hall. Maybe that's our conversation for that is, you know, piggybacking off our conversation today about how to get consideration out there. Maybe that final conversation should be about how do we promote our successes, have people reflect on what's changed and what's been a success and how to continue that momentum. So all of that, just to say, here comes Murph's sizzle reel. Mike, it actually might combine well with me doing 10, 15 minutes on Wakelet because Wakelet might be a good way for you to gather all of your successes. Done. So I'm willing to do that if that's what people want. Not next week, but the week after. The next day. Yeah, not next week, but the week after the seventh. All right, I put you on the list. Look at that. I actually have a plan now. Two weeks in advance. What am I going to do with all my time? Oh, my God, this is great. Okay, good. So, so Sarah's link is in there. And if she pops back in, um, we'll have her explain it real fast. Oh, no, she's totally gone now. I scared her away completely. Okay. Um, it's a skill I have. Um, scaring people away. All right. Sorry, bring us back. Final thoughts about what do we do? Gail, what do we do? Um, I think we keep talking. <laughs> I We've been doing this for 25 years. And it's still, you know, so we've got some more work to do, maybe 20 years, maybe. But um, I I love some of the ideas that came up today. I have, um, I don't know, I made notes of about 10 different things that we might do. Um, and we are taking this conversation uh, back to the slate, State Leaders and Assistive Technology Group uh, next week, I think. And, um, I, I, you know, if, if I, Mike, I'm kind of with you, if, if I could come up with a infographic one page thing, I'd make it a laminated sheet and a poster. And I did want to acknowledge that Beth was holding up the uh, AT wheel, yeah. which has been reissued by CAST um, through CEC. So that, oh, there's a I love them. them. I just wish they weren't so expensive per one because it's really cost prohibitive at the district yeah. level for me. Honestly, I'm still using some of the old ones because I have them and I have not yet been able to get somebody to approve what is it 10 $11 per school even for me to get another one. Yeah, and you know that's been a comment since they were first issued a gazillion years ago. Um, and the publisher always says, but because of the way it's constructed, it's really hard and expensive to create. So yeah. I don't know what we're going to do about that. I know some people have um, adapted and made their own versions that are printable. Yeah, I mean, I bought one and when you buy it, it comes with like an EPUB Code. of it. So I kind of, I haven't shared the EPUB version out because copyright, but then that gives me the ability to be in a meeting and not necessarily have that, have it on me um, because I often forget it or misplace the one I have. Um, so I, you, I do use the EPUB version, um, but I, it's such a great tool. I wish there was a way we could, I understand from a, a, a you know, publishing perspective and I don't want to just take the wheel and make that a, a poster because I know they worked really hard to produce that wheel. And I think what we need is something different. I, I don't, yeah. well, you I don't know, I, I, in terms of the kinds of things I'm thinking about, 
that wheel is even too dense. It's got mm -hmm. too much information on it. Really, I loved um, Paula Gutman from Georgia is really pushing for take a minute. That's her 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 uh, emphasis these days, and they're working. They're trying to come up with ideas about how to describe what that minute would look like in the context of an IEP team meeting. Um, I mean, I think some icons or something that was, you know, like you talked about an infographic, like some icons, like you don't have to list every, like it has so many things in here, alternative positions, side layer, standing frame, custom fitted wheel or chair. And if we could instead have like, you know, mobility, like taking these more as the categories more. And then you could easily link that category to a QR code that would take them to a video YouTube list or take yeah. them to a Google Doc or take them to a Wakelet. Um, you know, I think there's lots of ways to, to pare down that information so that if seating and positioning isn't something that's an issue, they're not bogged down by all the text that's there mm -hmm. trying to go through those to make sure it's not an issue and then move to the next one. The only Remember thing that, that happens with doing things like paring stuff down and putting things into categories is that there's a certain amount of background information that people need mm -hmm. to be able to see that. And when the beginner beginners come into assistive technology, they know the name of something. Yeah, and thing. so when they see that thing on the wheel, they, they're looking for that particular type of tool and don't know the category mobility aids. Mm -hmm. Like that is a wheelchair to them. Yeah. It's not things that might be, you know, arm supports for typing or all the other things that people that have been assistive technology a little bit know. And so that's part of the issues that I find with consideration and why we keep coming back around to it is because we always have true beginners. Yeah. Right? And, and you've got to look at the beginners from that lens, not from our multiple levels of experience lens. That's a hard thing to do once you've been into it. And yeah. I think the flip side of that, though, Kelly, is that even something like this to a true beginner is totally overwhelming. I understand how it can be overwhelming with all the names, um, but there's also those same kind of wheels that exist in accommodations for learning. And, and you know, there's like those reading wheels mm -hmm. right. that are for every grade level. So yeah, maybe it could be cut, those could be cut down a little and I didn't have anything to do with the development of that wheel, but yeah. I just find that when people see these categorical names in assistive technology, they're like, no, that's not my kid. But, and it could exactly be what they need. Well, that's why maybe demystifying those categorical names, like somewhere, that's where I think like an icon or an image can help demystify that. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not just one, like maybe for mobility aids, it's not simply a wheelchair. Maybe it's a series of like three different ones where to help people think and then agreed what like Alyssa or somebody else said, like have a way to link to more detail as it's needed. Same thing, like, you know, because otherwise I feel like then you also get into a thing where like, if it's not on this wheel, like there's this extensive list of things for interaction with the environment. Well, if it's not on this wheel, does that mean it's not something I should consider? So again, I think some way to make, um, to make it more digestible and less overwhelming, but have more, like have more meaning to it, right? Like that we can have that. And I still think it goes back to the questions that we ask. Um, yeah, I think it's almost more important to, to help frame the questions for them. Um, and then in some ways, I think that the, the way that we give it, like in Florida, we have a set of, of competencies for assistive technology professionals, and then we have competencies for IEP team members. And we've tried to, in our district, gear what professional development I'm giving to those competencies for IEP team members, because that's everybody. That's not, that's the parent, that's, you know, that's anybody who's sitting at the table who would be outside of what someone would consider the old school expert model, the me at the table. Um, and those have been very helpful to, to kind of guide, okay, what's really important for them to know in your your typical meeting that I wouldn't necessarily be in is to, to look at those IEP team member competencies. Great. All right, guys, it's, it's one minute to the top of the hour. So here's my wrap up stuff for us today. First of all, Gail, thank you for the question. I, that's a question we could talk about every week. 
and just continue to talk about it. Yeah, it's excellent. And we'll revisit this conversation because I think it's important and we should. Um, Take a minute and save the chat right now. This is mostly for you guys here, but really it's another rub in for people who don't show up here in person that they're not getting these resources. And it feels pretty good to do that. Um, but you have the link to Sarah's video in there. And there's a bunch of links that people shared throughout and they were really great. So make sure you get those. Um, quick reminder, we are again, not here next week. And I'm kidding, not even Hillary's gonna be here. Who are we kidding? Go take a day off all of you. Um, Go enjoy a day off. Make a three-day weekend out of it. Live a little. Um, but we will be back on the 7th. So we will finish up on the 7th. Um, kind of a how do we trumpet our successes? Where do we go from here? What do we do to plan for the fall? All that great stuff. Uh, so uh, hope you'll join us for AT Chat on Wednesday. And then in two weeks, we'll see you for the last town hall of the year. All right, everybody. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. <laughs>